Hello everyone and welcome to Civic Platform. This is your host Zuhair Al-Musri. Today I'm covering an event titled with Mental Health and Wellnesses for Winnipeg Seniors. And this event organized by uh, Manitoba Islamic Association to give an, uh, different uh, tips and advices for uh, our seniors. So let's find out how much important this lecture for our senior from this new episode from Civic Platform. Okay, um, so I come to here. Um, thank you for asking me. So my name is. Uh, Dr. Natasha Ali. I am a psychologist here in uh, Winnipeg and I was invited here to do a series of workshops on seniors and mental health and today was the first one and it's going to be one hour every Saturday morning from today for the next six weeks until um, just before the beginning of Ramadan. Okay so Zuhair the reason why this lecture is important is because if I think about the age of the seniors right now, they probably came from a family or a generation where mental health was not talked about in their families. It wasn't talked about in their youth, in their younger years. And so this is why it's important to talk about it now um, in, as they're getting older. So um, there's a lot of issues I think that um, seniors face. Isolation is a big one. Um, the pandemic did not help with that. It made things worse. So that's a big issue. Another issue is, of course, physical health and reduced mobility oftentimes. Um, and I do talk about a lot of other things like ageism, like having negative um, ideas about older people, which is internalized and, and older people are just feeling badly about themselves because they've internalized these ageist attitudes about themselves. Um, in some cases, elder abuse, which can negatively impact Obviously, the mental health of, of seniors, uh, grief is a big one, um, and also, you know, yeah, physical health challenges, dealing with family, um, worried about death, what's going to happen in the akhirah, those things, yes. Okay, so how we can encourage the seniors to talk and open up and give their advice, because a lot of them have really wonderful life experiences and advice, is this, it's a two-pronged approach. I think the first part is educating the youth and the middle-aged folks about how uh, valuable the seniors are in terms of the advice that they can give and the life experience, because that's something that we don't often, they probably don't hear as much or see as much um, in social media or in the communities. Um, so giving seniors more of a platform, I think, would be helpful. And then the other part is with the seniors, like empowering them and giving them a platform um, to talk and share their experiences, um, asking them to, for advice on a regular basis. Um, I think that, and just telling them that, you know, we have faith that, that uh, that you have some really good knowledge for us. Okay, so I'd like to um, welcome everybody to look at the lecture. I have so much more information in terms of what I just shared today.
I'd like to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Dr. Natasha Ali, and I am a psychologist. And I work at the, I have a private practice. I also work at the University of Manitoba, and I also do work here in the community, providing counseling to our community. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I haven't reached 65 yet, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> so basically, um, what I'd like to just point everybody's direction to, again, to the statistics that there's about 18% of people in Canada who are age 65 and over. In Manitoba, it's about 16%. And the number of centenarians, or people who are over 100, in all of Canada, it's about 13,405. And in Manitoba, it's 539, which is actually quite a bit. But some trends to notice in, in terms of the life cycle is that our population here in Canada, and in fact, most of the developed, quote unquote, developed world, is aging. Okay, so our societies, like if you look at North America, Canada, the US, um, Europe, even China, the, their populations are aging. It's when you go to other parts of the world, like the Middle East, the population is not aging. It's actually, get, it's, there's, um, I guess, people are younger in the Middle East than they are in the rest of the world. So anyway, one thing to remember is our population here, where we live in North America, is aging. Now, the fact that I just go, told you it's a US census data fact, but the same thing is pretty much we're seeing it here in Canada. And other trends that I wanted folks to kind of be aware of is that women have, tend to have a longer life expectancy than men. So um, in Canada, women age 65 are expected to live 22 years longer, whereas men age 65 are expected to live around 19 years longer. And these are just averages. Of course, every um, person who's older, there's going to be, we have unique uniqueness. So not everybody is going to meet this trend, but that's generally what we find. Um, so what that means is that as women grow older, they're more likely to be lonelier because it means that their male partners would likely, not always, but likely have died. So that's something to keep in mind. And the number of racialized seniors are expected to grow at a higher rate than the number of white seniors. So what that means is here in Canada, us, so we are considered a racialized community because we are Muslim and we, we are also come, like we are, you know, we come from different backgrounds. We're not white per se. So because of that, our percentages in the senior population is going to be growing as time goes on. So that's something to remember. And that's something interesting because um, we're just going to be more visible in terms of the senior population of this country. The one thing that I would like to point all of you to is that approximately, and I've seen this across many studies, approximately 20% of older adults will meet, will meet the criteria for a mental health di diagnosis. So 20%, that's actually um, about one in five, okay? And these are just, I just decided to list some of the mental health disorders that we're going to see amongst the seniors. So depression is a pretty common one. Anxiety disorder is a pretty common one, a generalized anxiety. Some kind of obsessive compulsive disorder. So you know, where people are thinking about things over and over again, or they're doing um, strange kinds of behaviors like cleaning, washing their hands hundreds of times, touching the door multiple times, or those kinds of things. That's like an obsessive compulsive disorder. Hoarding disorder. Um, it's something that we also see. Trauma and stressor-related disorders are pretty common. So if you haven't dealt with trauma from your childhood or you haven't dealt with trauma in your middle life years, it might end up showing up, the symptoms of that might end up showing up in your senior years when you're lonely and you're thinking about things, you're not working. Um, there might be acute stress disorder. Uh, adjustment disorders, and this is a big one, adjustment disorders, because a lot of people as they age and their families leave, it's an adjustment. 
when, you lose, when you're retired and you're not working nine to five, five days a week, that's an adjustment. And so you might be experiencing some de depression related to that adjustment. When your partner dies, if, you know, or if somebody else in your friends in your circle are dying around you, that can create some prolonged grief reactions. So these are some examples of depression or mental health issues that happen. Um, psychotic disorder, that's pretty common. This is where you start seeing things or hearing things that are not really there. Um, and then substance use disorders, hopefully that's not an issue in our community, but who knows, right? It's becoming an issue amongst the youth and it might become an issue over time um, as we age, as you see our population in this country age. Um, sleep disorders is pretty common, like insomnia, for example. And the most common one is neurocognitive disorder, where people are beginning to see the signs of Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia, or Parkinson's disease, okay? So uh, there are other myths that people have in terms of getting older. So some people think when I'm getting older, because I'm not working, because people around me are dying, because my health is getting worse, I'm gonna get more depressed, right? But actually, that's not true. That's actually not true. What we find is that the prevalence rates of mental illness in older people or older adults are fairly stable. And they're actually lower than the mental health, uh, the prevalence rates of mental illness in the youth. So the youth are actually having a harder time. There's a higher incidence of mental illness in youth than there are in um, older adults. So older adults, just because we're getting older and we're starting to lose things, doesn't mean that um, there's suddenly a bigger rate of mental illness. That's not true. Okay? So the other myth that we have is that older people don't commit suicide. Of course, in our community, this is, um, I mean, we're not supposed to be uh, committing suicide or things like that, but you know, we're all human and sometimes our trials, our tribulations get to us and we actually, um, sometimes we actually have suicidal thoughts. But one thing that I would say about older people is that the rates for suicide in men age 70 and older is, in the US anyway, it's actually the highest amongst any other age group. And this is especially true for white males but it's increasing for black males, and it's getting higher, it's rising for older women too. So we're seeing that there's a little bit of a shift in terms of suicide rates. What are some of the risk factors that might lead people to have a depressive disorder? So there's a couple of things. So if you have a pre-existing mental health disorder, obviously, as you get older, and if you haven't dealt with your mental health issues, Obviously, that's going to be a risk factor for you having a difficult time in your older years. Poverty is also a risk factor. Being female is also a risk factor. We tend to see that women tend to have more mental health issues, or they report having more mental health issues than men, anyway. Being racialized, like us, okay, um, can be, that they're finding that that's a risk factor too. The pandemic has actually been a serious risk factor for many of our older people. And I'll get into that more um, in a bit. So, and the other, the biggest risk factor, I think, is remembering the generation that you folks have come from. Maybe you've come from a generation where people didn't talk about mental health, right? It wasn't something that your family talked about. It wasn't something that was discussed. You just moved on and dealt with things. So that's why what we find in folks who are this generation of seniors anyway, is that they're less likely to, um, compared to young folks, they're less likely to be aware of and acknowledge their mental health issues. They're less likely to be aware of their mental health issues and less likely to acknowledge it and therefore less likely to get help. Okay, so that's another risk factor for having um, poor mental health in our senior years. 
So this is something that we need to, um, that older folks need to be aware of. Like, well, what exactly does it mean if I have a mental health issue? And what we find with older folks is that they tend to report more physical health issues rather than mental health issues. So they talk more about, oh, I have a pain here, oh, I have, this is aching, or I had this um, symptom that's, you know, something about my health that's not um, working, I need to go see my doctor. And sometimes these health conditions, it's actually more of a sign of depression than it actually is about a physical health problem. So older folks are more likely to report a physical health issue than a mental health issue. So that's, what, that's another thing that we find. The death rates actually were the highest among those age 75 plus for the pandemic, especially in the beginning. And the people who were mostly affected were long-term residents. Um, long-term care residents, and they accounted for 40% of the COVID-19 deaths in the US. Okay, so older people were really hit quite significantly by COVID-19. And again, when you're thinking about they already have pre-existing health conditions, this makes sense. Um, quarantining, being alone, having to go to the hospital without visitors, um, losing family members, and difficulty using technology. I mean, for those who's able to use her Zoom, which is great, but there are many seniors in our community, they really have a, a tough time with technology. And so that can make them feel even more isolated. And so the isolation is a risk factor for poor mental health. Okay, so another risk factor in terms of declining mental health for seniors, and this is something that I'd like to really talk about. These are things that we don't really talk about in our community. Or oh, maybe we do, some people do. Um, but there, there's two things that I'd like to talk about. The first one is ageism. Now, ageism is a belief system that we have about older people. And usually that belief system is a negative one. Like we live in a society that actually loves young people. When we look at the news and we look at movies and we look at music, I don't know if some of you look at music, I, I do. Um, you know, there's a lot of young people represented in social media in books and magazines and videos and YouTube, a lot of young people. Where are the older people? Even though they're 20% of our population, we actually don't see them very much. And so then this is an issue in our society. So this, it relates to a belief called ageism. And I took a definition from the Ontario Human Rights Commission to define what ageism is. So ageism refers to two beliefs, okay? It's a socially constructed way of thinking. What I mean socially constructed, it's, it's um, an, an artificial belief. It's nothing from the Quran, for example. It's nothing from, um, you know, it's not inherent to us as human beings. It's something that our society has prescribed for us. We didn't ask for it to be like that. It's just something that exists in our society and we made it up. We can deconstruct it, but we have made up this story about older people. And what is, what is it, the story that we made up? That um, we have some negative attitudes about people who are aging, some stereotypes and some negative attitudes, like, oh, they're slow, or they're weak, or they're frail, or they're stupid, or they're sick, or they're, uh, ugly or they're you know like things like this like there's a lot of beliefs that he, that we have about older people and that's why when we become older we don't feel good about ourselves we our self-esteem actually goes down because we internalize a lot of those beliefs that we're ugly that we're and that's why there's a lot of people if you look at a lot of the artists in Hollywood like uh, J Lo, for example, going for plastic surgery. Like, I mean, people, it's like people want to defy aging. They want to continue to look young because they associate old age with all of these negative things. My own sister in law, you know, she's like, oh, yeah, no, I'm going to do this plastic surgery and that plastic surgery because I don't, I don't want to look my age. And so there's a lot of negative stereotypes about aging. And this can negatively impact the mental health of, of older people. 
So, and there's a tendency to uh, structure society based on the assumption that everyone is young and failing, and what that means is that we don't respond appropriately to the older people in our community. It's, and especially like we live in a society, not only do we see a lot of young people, everything has to be fast, quick, 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 quick. Okay, so when we have an older person who is in a wheelchair, for example, or who is walking slowly, it's like we don't have the patience. Or if they can't remember things and they're taking a long time or they're repeating themselves, you know, it's like we don't have the patience, the people who are younger. And you know, that's part of our, our faith is to have patience. I almost feel like Allah has made this journey for us. If you think about it, when we were younger, our parents didn't have patience for us because we were maybe being too active and not listening to them, maybe disobeying them. And then when we get older, it's like the tables have turned. And now we are a little bit slower, we can't remember, we're repeating things. And then again, there's that impatience that comes up. So there's an impatience with the vulnerable children and there's that impatience with the vulnerable older people. So it's almost like Allah is wanting, giving us situations with the people around us to learn patience. And how do we combat this ageism? This is very important. So what we need to do is, as people who have parents who are aging, or friends who are aging, or people in our community who are aging, we need to remember that everyone needs to be treated as individuals, okay? We're not treating the person as an elderly person or a senior, we're treating them as an individual. Once we say this is an individual, we're going to, try, we, that's the beginning of dismantling the stereotype about older people. So we're not dealing with an older person, we're dealing with an individual. And we need to assess people on their own merits instead of our beliefs and assumptions about them. So really looking at people for their own merits. Like I'm sure there's lots of people here who have gifts. What are some, what are some things that people do here that, are, that they would say it's a, it's a positive quality that they have? And just and to look at your own merits. And to be given the same opportunities and benefits um, to everyone regardless of their age. And it's important to recognize, this is an important point, that older people make significant contributions to our society and that we must not limit their potential. When we become older, we have gained a huge, amassed a huge lifetime of experience. And those, of, those who are younger need to appreciate that lifetime of experience. They've had lots and lots and lots and lots of experiences. Maybe you're more sophisticated in terms of how you think about life and how you think about difficulties, for example. So this is something that we need to remember, that our older people bring a lot of contributions to our society. We can learn a lot from our elders, and we can learn a lot of history and really important information if we sit down, take the time to sit down and talk to our elders. The other thing that I'd like to talk about, which is something that we don't talk about a lot, again, in our community, but it's very important, is elder abuse. Now, ageism leads to elder abuse. Ageism is a concept that leads to elder abuse. So elder abuse, um, I, basically what I did is I got a definition of elder abuse from the WRHA, and remember, Allah has created us in such a way that we were vulnerable when we were young, we were completely dependent on our parents, we couldn't work or we couldn't make a living, we were completely de dependent on them, and when we are older, we're not working anymore, our health is declining, and we're, we've in a way also become dependent. So elder abuse, what is this? It's abuse towards older adults, um, a, and it's any action or inaction by a, by a person in a position of trust that causes harm to an older adult, okay? And abuse happens when someone they know, and often someone they actually really love and care about, uh, limits and controls their rights and freedoms. And this is very painful, because as we age, our freedom is already limited. As Mian was saying, you know, sometimes our health is in a position where we can't, we're not as mobile. And so when you have someone who's abusing you on top of that, 
They're restricting a, a freedom on top of a freedom that's already restricted. So it can feel, feel very painful. Um, and the older adult is unable freely to make choices because they're afraid of being humiliated, hurt, left alone, or the relationship ending. And so it, it's a very, so that's why a lot of older people who are facing elder abuse don't speak up because they're scared that the relationship will be over if I say something. And so it's, it's, a, it, it's almost like they feel trapped. And most often, abuse of older adults occurs within the family, okay? Usually it's within the family, by adult children or grandchildren or a spouse or a partner, okay? So it's usually somebody that you know. I know of many cases in my own family where um, the younger ones took advantage of the older ones by saying, oh, you know, you're not thinking right about this, so I think you should change your will, and I think you should give this to this one, and this one to that one, and that's not uncommon. You know, so it's, there's often abuse of older adults within the family themselves, and that's why there's a little bit of shame in terms of talking about it, because it's like you don't want to rat out your own family. But it can be, it can be a very, have a very negative impact on the mental health of the senior who is being abused. Um, when the abuser is a spouse or a partner, it's domestic violence. It's not elder abuse, it's actually domestic violence if it's your partner doing it. And anyone in a position of trust can be doing this. So it could be a, not only within the family, it could be a friend or a neighbor, a caregiver, a landlord, a lawyer, I mean, a, a spiritual advisor, financial advisor, it could be anybody who can, who can commit this abuse. And um, it can come in many different types. It could be emotional, verbal, or psychological, where people are saying, they're raising their voice to you and telling you you're stupid or you're so dumb or you're so slow, or come on, or get, you know, like being very harsh and using bad words with you. Um, it could be psychological in the sense of ignoring you when you talk or not giving you the same attention like they used to. Um, it could be um, emotional in the sense of, you know, saying some things like, Emotional blackmailing, if you don't do this, then I'm not gonna come around and see you anymore, or something along those lines. So it could be emotional, psychological, or verbal. It doesn't have to be physical. Physical abuse is actually where someone is hitting or slapping or kicking you. Um, it could also be sexual abuse. Actually, they, there is sexual abuse for seniors as well. Neglect is a big one, like forgetting the, your loved, older loved ones. And of course, financial, that's a big one. A lot of people know that there's probably wills, um, and that's where financial abuse can occur. And in case you're wondering the incidence, apparently uh, 7,500 to 19,000 older Manitobans experience one or more forms of abuse or neglect at some point in their later years. And I just put down a number, there's a number that uh, a line, a, twi a 24 line, our line that you can call if you're experiencing elder abuse to get some um, support. So the last slide, yes, okay, so these are some of the signs to look out for. Remember I had mentioned that a lot of elderly people don't know what a mental health issue looks like. So these are some of the symptoms. If your sleep is off, you're sleeping too little, like Jamila was saying, she's, she can't really sleep. She's sleeping too much or too little. If your appetite is off, meaning you're eating too much or too little, your energy is off, but that might be natural, that might be a part of aging. Your concentration, you can concentrate. There's a loss of interest in previously interesting activities. You're feeling sad, angry, guilty. You have suicidal thoughts, homicidal thoughts. I don't know if, if um, you remember, but there was a homicide that happened in Toronto, and it was actually an older man who killed, I think, four or five people on the board of his condominium, and he was like over seven years old. Um, sexual behavior is off, there's health symptoms like stomach aches, headaches, muscle aches, chest pains, difficulty breathing, and frequent difficulties with memory. Again, that might be a sign of aging, but it could also be a sign of depression. So if you have five or more of these things, and it's lasting 
anywhere from two weeks to two years, then we might have a mental health issue that's going on. And that's when you may want to speak to someone like your doctor or a psychologist or counselor to, to rule that out. Okay, so that's what I have for today. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Zuhair, um, so thank you so much for interviewing me. I hope that folks were able to get something for themselves out of the presentation. And I guess a point that I would leave off that's important would be to really develop the patience as someone who's not yet in my older years but getting there, to develop our patience to give the respect and the value to the seniors that they deserve. We reached the end of our episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this episode, please like, share, and subscribe, and wait for a new episode from Civic Platform.